All right, welcome back to another CNT 140 lesson, Troubleshooting Land Wiring, Chapter 17. The object or the objective that we'll be covering in this chapter will be common failure modes, copper faults, fiber faults, category and workmanship, and troubleshooting approaches. So, let's get started. Any complex system is subject to periodic failures, and land wiring systems are no different. Throughout this book, we've emphasized the installation of a reliable wiring system. We have uh, spent a great deal of time showing the proper components and installation techniques that are required to create a, a properly functioning, reliable cable plant. The precept for this careful instruction is that when anything does go wrong, it should, be rarely, it should rarely be the cabling. Some might say never rather than rarely, but your land wiring is an environment where it cannot totally be protected from those uncaring souls without the proper respect for these little thin wires. The fact of the matter is that failures do happen. Fortunately, most of the failures happen during installation, where the link operation is not critical. Still, the failed cable must be repaired, regardless of the circumstances. If the link has been in operation, it is uh, all the more important that we make the repairs quickly. Cabling failures can be divided into two broad classes with respect to land wiring. Classes of failures correspond to the types of test equipment for each. Failures involving basic cable function can be determined by the basic test equipment we talked about in Chapter 15. And this equipment can check cable link connectivity and DC wire map. Failures involving performance-based uh, cable function must be determined by the diagnostic and measurement equipment that we covered. The equipment tests the performance of the cable link at the level of performance required for your particular LAN application. It tests for split pairs, impedance, near and crosstalk, length, attenuation, and other parameters that are required for proper LAN operation. The basic function can be fine, but the link will still not operate if it doesn't meet your performance needs. For example, you probably get DC connectivity on the barbed wire fence, but you, you wouldn't be able to run data on it. In this chapter, we'll detail many of the types of cable link failures, whether they are from installation errors or cable damage after installation. We'll give some approach to finding the problem and repairing the cable link. We'll say a little about a successful troubleshooting approach that you may find uh, useful. So let's look at the common failure modes. It's important to understand how, many, how land cabling can fail in order to help you isolate and troubleshoot the problems with, with your cable. In this section, we're going to examine the common problems that may occur with an installed cable system and how to determine the best way to alleviate the problem. Copper cable failure modes. Copper cabling is the land wiring type that is most prone to failure, both during the installation and after the cable has been in the wall. Ideally, the installer should do a a uh, good job of routing and terminating each cable and should verify the link is properly connected and passes the performance measures for the desired category. However, if a failure occurs, you must examine the cable and connections to find that problem. Even if the cable link was once in perfect condition, cable runs can be physically damaged and poorly made connections can fail over time. Occasionally, even cabling components such as connectors can fail. Uh, a wire break. One of the most common wiring failures is a broken wire. Most testers will report the wire as an open, meaning that the circuit is open. Some testers may actually declare the entire pair bad, although only one wire uh, might be open. A wire that uh, was never connected will also test open, even though the failure is not a result of a wire damage, if only one wire of the multi-wire cable is open. You should probably look for a bad connection at one of the termination points. Connections and installation displacement connectors such as 66M or 110 blocks sometimes are not driven home resulting in a bad or intermittent connection. So what happens is that the installation is not quite stripped away and apparently good connection will actually have a thin layer of insulating uh, plastic remaining. You should never reuse old 66M blocks. Uh, the contact jaws can perform can deform outward just enough to cause a problem when new wires are punched. This uh, can also happen if a larger gauge wire was previously punched down. 
These blocks uh, may also have the same problem with jumper wires that are frequently moved. You may be able to rehabilitate a contact by squeezing the, the empty uh, contact jaw together with a sharp nose pliers or even by rocking the punch down tool back and forth to the, in the contact. The 110 type blocks are much less prone to this problem as they are a uh, they use a cutting displacement method of termination uh, where the connector uh, contact actually uh, slices through the wire's uh, insulation. Strain of wire must never be used in a 66 or 110 type connecting block. These blocks require solid wire and connections made with strain of wire often fail. The insulation or IDC contact needs to actually cut into the solid uh, uh, conductor slightly and there simply is no way to do that with stranded wire. The strands move out of the way and deform their shape when pushed down into the IDC terminal. The connection uh, now depends on very slight uh, pressure and low contact resistance. These stranded wire connections will often fail over time and temporarily heal when the wire is touched, although this is uh, not technically a break, the symptoms are still the same. If inspection of the cable termination end uh, does not reveal the open wire, the use of a cable scanner to measure the length to, to the open wire uh, might uh, reveal your, uh, the problem. mid cable open wires may be very hard to find visually unless there's obvious mechanical damage to the cable. And you never want to find out uh, that an installed cable hasn't opened uh, due to a manufacturer defect because it's almost impossible to prove that the break did not occur during the installation. It's a good idea to do a continuity check on each reel of cable prior to installation. During installation, be careful not to pull the cables over sharp edges as the cable might be cut. See the next two sections for advice on how to repair a twisted pair cable, open or short. A wire short. A wire short in some ways is easier to deal with than an open. A short is rarely caused by a bad connection at a termination, so you can initially skip that inspection. Cable scanner may be able to locate the short within a few feet, and if you do not have access to a scanner, use a sensitive ohm meter uh, and the specification for cable resistance linear per foot uh, to find the approximate uh, location of the short. If more than two wires are shorted, this test may be useless as the linear resistance will be much less than expected. Shorts are often caused by other contractors trapping the cable between sharp objects during construction and remodeling. For example, the cable might be pinched between metal studs as a wall is assembled and the ubiquitous plasterboard screw uh, also does a very nice job of piercing right through a, a cable, shorten the wires in the process. Sometimes, very infrequently, we hope cable installers will pull the cable past a sh um, will pull the cable past a sharp edge, cutting through the insulation and shorting wires in the cable. The method used for a repair of a short or an open depends on the type of cable and the performance requirements. Coax may be cut in half, the two ends uh, connectorized, and a barrel connector used to join the ends back together. Fiber can be spliced. Twisted pair repair methods depend on the category of performance desired. Technically, the 5TAC standard allows no splices in the horizontal cable. However, practical consideration may dictate some variance with CAT3 cable runs. CAT3 has a more gentle twist than CAT5 or CAT6, and it is possible to carefully perform a splice using a shrink wrap solder splice available from several sources. Uh, the hollow shrinkable plastic splice is a tiny tube about one inch long and a narrow ring of low solder, low temperature solder in the middle. The insulation is removed on the wires to be joined, about one centimeter is enough, and then the wires to be joined are then placed into the splice from opposite ends and then the splice heated with a uh, with a proper heat gun tool to melt the solder and then shrink the plastic. Uh, pocket lighter is not a proper tool for soldering, but it works fine in, in a pinch. The next conductor from the same pair is then wrapped around the first wire in the same direction as the natural twist, and the uh, wire ends are then joined to, in the same manner. This uh, approximately maintains the gentle Cat 3 twist, but it's not adequate for 5 or 
5e or 6. An alternative method will form a uh, splice even for cat 5e. The 5c allows one transition point from uh, round to flat cable in a horizontal cable run. This means that an allowance has been made for an inevitable untwist and near end crosstalk that would result in terminating each cable end at the point of transition. Now, logically, you should be able to reinsert to insert a plug and jack coupling to repair a cable cut or short, but that's not really allowed as it, amount, as it amounts to a splice. However, if a quick solution will get, you, get your network back up and running, this method will be used temporarily until a new cable can be pulled. You should only use a properly rated plug and jack for the, category, uh, for the cable's category of operation. And it may seem easier to use two cable end plugs and an 8-pin uh, FF coupler for this, but that is actually two plug and jack combinations, not one. Also, it's very unlikely that the 8-pin coupler will meet the standard higher than CAT3. In addition, many of these couplers also reverse the order of the pins, causing uh, yet another type of failure. And finally, mark the point of the splice on your cable mat. If the splice is temporary, you'll want to go back and pull a new cable as soon as you can, uh, as the need to replace the cable will be inversely proportional to how long you wait. If you want to have a CAT5 facility but are using only CAT3 applications now, this place uh, may work now, but it'll fail when you upgrade to higher applications. Uh, kinks, bends, breaks. Uh, the effect of the kinks, uh, bends, and breaks, and bends in the cable vary with the type of cable that you're using. Coax is probably the most resistant to this type of damage because of the size of dur and durability of the cable. However, severe kinks and very sharp sustained bends will affect the transmission loss on the cable and may even cause an impedance reflection uh, that could cause a failure. Twisted pair cable may also be subject to transmission impairment due to kinks or sharp bends. As unbelievable as it may sound, even uh, tight uh, tie wraps may distort the cable enough to cause this problem. The real problem with kinks or bends in twisted pair cable is that the defect actually distorts the geometry of the cable. This can easily be observed on the screen of a time domain reflector. Uh, distorting the cable shows up as a reflection hump in the return signal. Severe bending can actually cause permanent signal uh, impairment. How serious the impairment will, will depend on the category of operation and just how near the operating margins of the link that you're operating. A major source of kinks in cables is the use of box rather than real cable. These uh, cable boxes are designed to allow the cable to feed in a spiral fashion without the need for conventional cable spools and real holders. Unfortunately, the cable can sometimes feed more than one loop of cable uh, and then the loops get mixed together trying to get them out of the box. Other times, a single loop twists so that it does not feed in a spiral fashion as the loop collapses, then a kink results. Of course, kinks can occur easily in loose coils of cable that have been unboxed or unreeled. So try to avoid kinks, uh, particularly in Cat 5 v or 6 operation. If a kink occurs, <clears throat> attempt to smooth out the kink as much as possible, but be aware that you may have to replace the run if it later fails in testing. The 5CKC standard recommends a minimum bend radius of four times the cable diameter. For most cables, that radius is about three-quarter to one inch. Try to avoid pulling cable uh, tightly around corners and use cable management retainers to provide a smooth transition to the point of termination. Uh, connector opens. Modular connectors may fail because of open connections. The most common conditions are bad plug crimps, dislodged wire, bent jack pins, and bad connector seating. The popularity of modular plugs and telephone wiring has resulted in the availability of low-cost six-pin crimp tools. These tools may be made from plastic or lightweight steel. Unfortunately, the flimsy design has been extended to eight-position crimpers. The eight-pin modular plug is much more difficult to properly crimp than plugs with six pins. A low-cost tool often cannot properly seat the connector contacts in the center of the plug. 
This may result in one or more of the stranded wires not making contact, or worse, making intermittent contact. You can easily identify plugs crimped with one of the uh, inferior cools, uh, tools. When viewed from the front, the middle contacts are visibly higher than the contacts near the edge of the uh, connector plug. Recrimping rarely makes any difference unless it's done with a proper crimp tool. You should spend the extra money to purchase a high quality crimp tool. These tools are heavily constructed and will be quite a bit more expensive than the low cost tools. Some may have interchangeable dies for different sizes of modular connectors. A high quality crimp tool for 8 pin modular plugs should cost around $100 to $200 depending on additional features. Bad crimps may also allow a wire to be pulled out of the plug contact area. The same type of problem can happen in a cable termination at a workstation outlet or a patch panel or punch down in the telecommunications room. These connections are not made for very large force, uh, are not made for very large pulling forces and may fail when overstressed. User cords in the work area are particularly subject to these kinds of damages because they are often run along the floor and in the path of a chair, leg, furniture, and feet. Always inspect both ends of a cord that is suspected to have a bad connection. Replace the cord if there appears to be any damage. Source of intermittent connections in modular plug is the use of solid wire. These plugs were really designed for stranded wire and solid wire does not work well. Special versions of modular plugs are allegedly designed to work with uh, solid wire and they do work better, but you'll be much better off if you use only stranded wire with these plugs. In rare cases, modular connector jacks may not seat properly in the connector uh, faceplate. Some designs include the plug channel in the molded plate with a separate jack assembly that snaps into the plate. If the rear module is not seated properly, the jack wires may be uh, too far back to properly connect with um, with the club, plug's contacts. Even though the plug clip seats with a sharp click, um, in rare cases modular jack pins may be may get crossed or bent. Now this is this will usually test as a shorted wire from the far end and as an open connection from the near end. The design of these jacks uh, places the pins, which are really bent wire pins, in narrow plastic slots so that they can move as the plug is inserted. At the top of the tracks, most jacks have an open area where the pins could slide from side to slot, side to side in the wire pin when the wire pin is pushed up or too far. Uh, if the pin is allowed to slip into another pin's track, either during assembly or use, the pins will short together and one or both of, of them may be prevented from making any contact at all with their corresponding plug contact. If you suspect this problem, visually inspect the plate and replace the jack if it is damaged. The defect uh, tends to permanently bend the wire pin and you may have a uh, continuing problem. So it's just a good idea to glance at the pins in each jack insert before you terminate the station cables. This only takes a, uh, about a second and will save you hours of frustration later on. Modular jacks should be mounted so that the pins are on the top side of the jack opening. The theory is that this keeps dust and dirt from contaminating the pins. Jacks are also available with dust covers which should be left in place until the jack is used and replaced when a plug is removed. A punch down blocker, patch panel punch down block, is a special type of connector. Some older style 66M punch down blocks require the use of metal clip to connect between the contacts in different columns. The standard 66M block has four columns of contacts across a punch down position. Generally, the contacts are internally wired as pairs, so that column 1 and column 2 con uh, contacts are connected in common, as are 3 and 4. However, some connectorized designs make all four columns independent so that a clip must be placed across the contacts in adjacent columns to complete the circuit. A missing clip will cause a problem with the circuit. An additional problem with punch blocks uh, of any type uh, concerns the use of stranded wire. This, these side displacement or insulation uh, cutting terminals are designed for solid wire only. Do not use stranded wire with these blocks. The wire may not make good contact because the contacts press in from the side 
instead of clamping the wire or piercing into the strands. Even if an initial contact is made, the wire may pull free more easily because much of the strain resistance on the contact depends on uh, trapping a solid wire in the contact. And occasionally, a connector block open can occur when the punch down tool cuts the cable end of the wire being terminated rather than the scrap end. A tool may sometimes cut the adjacent wire to the wire being terminated. If it, so it's a good idea to check the terminated wires to be sure uh, none seem to be loose. Cut or loose wires that should then be re-terminated. Coax cables are subject to having their connections uh, pulled open by connector stress. Uh, crimped or soldered uh, center conductor pins are fairly sturdy, but the pin may sometimes be pulled back into the connector body and not make contact with the mating jack. A visual inspection will show, will show a pin that seems too short. The center pin should be approximately even with the edge of the shield sleeve, uh, not the bayonet sleeve. Uh, cables that are pulled on while mated uh, also break the shield wires. If a coax shield is improperly stripped, many of the tiny wires that form the braid will be severed, uh, with only a few remaining to make the connection. When pulled, these last few wires will break easily, leaving an open. Uh, and the proper solution then is to cut off the end, prepare the wire properly, and then replace the entire connector. Any coax land wiring that uses BNC T's or terminators may be subject to openness due to failure of a terminator. As a matter of fact, many technicians consider the T component to be the primary cause of coax network problems. The connector may fail by literally falling apart or it may exhibit intermittent connections that just add to the frustration. Low-cost connectors are the worst offenders. You would be wise to use high-quality connectors, T's, and terminators on these systems. Wrong pinouts. Of all the wiring problems that we discuss in, uh, in the test equipment in Chapter 15, uh, are common failures to cable links. Now, among these are reversing the order of some of the wires, crossing two pairs, flipping the wiring order, splitting pairs, and total miswires altogether. Reversing the order um, occurs in, in pairs. A common mistake is to reverse the primary and tracer colors of a single pair. Another common mistake is to mix up the green and brown pairs, or split these pairs, since the, the color difference may be subtle in some cable. If you try to count pin numbers in a modular jack, be sure to position the jack correctly. Flipping the wiring order of, uh, of a user cord is a common error with, uh, with flat or silver satin telephone style wire. Of course, you should never, never, never use flat cables for land wiring cords. Inspect the wiring order by holding both cord ends side by side. The colors um, to the extent that you can see them, should be in the same order straight across the, uh, the plug. Better yet, use a cable checker. The standard color code for a four pair should be followed in wiring of all jacks and telecommunication terminations. This code is different for punch down blocks and modular jacks. Modular jacks actually have two color code standards, T568A and B. You must use the same uh, standard throughout the horizontal cable run. This means that you must use a, the A wiring pattern at the workstation outlet if the A wiring was used at the patch panel termination. Keep this uh, straight, uh, keeping this straight is much more difficult if you use pre-assembled octopus fan out cables for your equipment connection. Be certain which wiring pattern standard is used with the octopus cable and Use the same at the workstation outlet jack. Using different wiring patterns results in reverse pairs, uh, uh, indication on the testers. Uh, you can go back to chapter two of the book for more details on these color codes uh, and wiring patterns, or part two of the book. There are nearly as many ways to connect station wires to a modular jack as there are modular jack manufacturers. The most confusing jack wiring problems stem from the fact that the pairs are not connected to the pins of the modular jack uh, in the same order as if they're punched down in a, in a telecommunications room. For example, in the telecommunications room, 
the cable is terminated on a 66M or 110 block in the order 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now that means that blue-white, which is pair 1, gets punched down first on the first two pins of the cable position. Orange-white, um, pair 2 in the next position, so, and so on. At the modular jack, however, pair 1 is terminated such that it connects to pins 4 and 5. The orange and white or the green white pair is then terminated on pins 1 and 2 depending on whether you're using A or B. Now the terminations on the jack module are numbered the same as the pin order. You have to be sure to place the wires into the correct slots before you terminate them. This will be very different from the one in the punch down block. Fortunately many jack modules have color coded wire slots so you can ignore the confusing position numbers. If you choose to split your station cables into two jacks, the two pair um, per jack, you'll have an extra fun figuring out what color code to use at each jack. If you must do this, one approach is to call each pair in a two pair set, pair A or pair B. Um, plan which pins in the modular jack should respond to each pair and then draw a connection diagram, skipping the unused wire positions on the jack. This avoids the obvious difficulty that you'd have trying to place pair 1 and pair 2 3 in the wrong positions. Of course, all the color codes on the jack will be completely wrong, but you want to do this anyway, so it's your own problem now. Okay. For a better approach, uh, and one that is allowed by the Plastic HC, is to wire up the jack with the normal A or B pattern, and then use an adapter cable external to the outlet jack. Simply make, or have one made, an adapter that connects two pair cables uh, terminated in two plugs at one end to a then single modular plug uh, with each wire placed appropriately. That will split out the station cable to the, to, uh, to the uh, two applications and avoid making your jack plate totally non-standard. Uh, but of course we always have to remember that this only works for uh, the particular category standard that you're trying to work with. Now we just mentioned category, wrong categories. Another common failure of high performance applications results from the use of the wrong category of cable and or connectors. Either, uh, either mistake will cause most performance critical applications to fail. Remember that the category of performance is limited to the lowest category component or cable used in the link. In addition, of course, you must maintain the distance below the limit. Route the wire away from potential interference sources. Maintain minimum twists of pairs. Many older cabling systems can support CAD3 operation. Cable that is uh, four pair and has a minimum of two to three twists per foot should operate, although not necessarily at the distance limit. A cable that barely meets CAD3 cannot be used for CAD5 or higher standards. Multi pair cables of 25 or more pairs should be limited to 6 circuits or 12 pair to minimize the effects of crosstop that occurs on such cables. Analog telephone circuits can usually be, uh, be accommodated on pairs in the same cable uh, as their frequency of operation is much lower than land frequencies. However, you must use caution when placing digital telephone signals, including ISDN, in the same cable jacket as LAN data, as the two may very well interfere with each other. Many modern phone systems are digital systems and fall into this area of caution. The best rule is to use only one application per cable, even with analog systems. A later upgrade of your phone equipment might inadvertently shut down your LAN. Excessive untwisting. The amount of untwisted cable that is allowable when operating a CAT3 is so great that it is easy to view the CAT5 and CAT6 requirements. Uh, with that, to view these with skepticism. After all, how could you go from a generous allowance of two or more inches of loosely twisted wire to a ridiculous requirement of less than a half of an inch? Well, the answer is easily found when you consider that the maximum frequency of interest of the two categories jumps from 10 to 100 or 250 megahertz. Obviously, CAT 5 e and 6 requirements are much more stringent because they have, they have to be to assure cabling performance at a higher level. Good cabling practice 
is to limit the amount of untwist to only that required to terminate the wires. This is good practice whether you are terminating CAT uh, 6 or CAT 3. Another good practice is to strip back enough, uh, only enough uh, of the router jacket as is needed to terminate the pairs. This maintains the cable twist and the positioning of the individual pairs in relation to each other. The better uh, connectors and cable terminations have additional cable management devices to secure the wire in place and to minimize stress and bending of the wire. Wrong impedance. Throughout this book we've talked about UTP cabling and 100 ohm impedance and STV cabling and 150 ohm impedance. Any mixing of these two types of wires in the same cable link will result in impedance mismatch. Now that may cause the link to fail. The different impedances causes a signal reflection at the point of, in of intersection that will affect even lower speed network links. At the, high, at the higher speeds, the impedance mismatch is critical to overall circuit performance. These standards generally allow for the expected variations in impedance from one lot of cable to the next. A variation of plus or minus 15% is allowed and more may be acceptable on short cable runs, although it would technically not meet the standard. The real problem is that network equipment is designed to expect a cable impedance of 100 or 150 ohms. Using a cable with a higher or lower impedance will cause a less power to be coupled to the cable pair and result in a lower received signal arriving at the other end. If the end also sees an impedance mismatch, even more power will be lost in the transfer. Receiver performance depends on a certain minimum signal strength to override the crosstalk interference from the near end. If a lower than expected signal strength is received, link performance will suffer and may even cause the link to fail. One final note of caution. Other twisted pair cables exist with different impedances than are in the standard. For example, in some parts of the world, 120 ohm twisted pair is widely available. This cable should not be mixed with 100 ohm cable in land wiring applications. Be sure your cable is the proper impedance for standard land installations. Fiber optic cable failure mode. Fiber optic cabling always takes a back seat to copper cabling when people are considering field failures. At one time, this was logical because only two simple types of cabling were available, and there were only a small number of potential fiber optic connectors, of which one, the ST, was clearly dominant. Nowadays, nothing can be farther from the truth. Modern fiber optic cabling systems are nearly as complex as their copper counterparts as long as pair reversals and cross pairs are discounted. Fiber optic installation errors. At the initial installation phase, fiber optic cables are terminated into fiber optic patch panels in the telecommunications room. The installer must verify the link. Uh, the link meets the appropriate transmission performance standards, including link loss, return loss, and bandwidth. The installer must also verify that the proper connectors were used and that the connections were properly marked. Marking fiber optic connections is extremely important as we covered in the chapter on fiber technology. Each pair of fibers are assigned into an A and a B connector position. The reason is to ensure that the transmit and receive polarities can be maintained uh, when equipment cables are plugged in. Another important marking is the specific type of fiber terminated at the connector. Multi-mode and single-mode fiber optics are not compatible and a mismatch can cause an unacceptable level of signal loss. There are two popular core diameters for multi-mode fiber and a similar signal loss will occur if you don't know which type of jumper cable to use for the equipment connection. In addition, newer types of multi-mode fiber may be laser optimized and this needs to be properly marked. Mixed-mode fiber optic cables are popular as a method of future uh, future proofing a fiber run. Installation of fiber tends to be more expensive than copper and users can avoid some future installation delays and costs by putting in more strands and modes than you currently need. Fiber optic cables are available with a mix of 
single mode strands, multi mode strands, and even copper pairs. You must keep track of which strand is which mode. Terminating two different fiber modes in the same termination box can cause a great deal of confusion in the future. Be certain that you are, you or your installer clearly mark each fiber optic connector uh, with the mode and core diameter. Ignoring the fine details of these installation points may reduce your capability of a fiber link uh, considerably uh, or even keep a link from functioning at all. It is extremely difficult to determine fiber type after installation is complete. Most of the time, it's a real bother to try to trace terminated fibers to their cable jacket so you can look up the cable type on the jacket. It is much easier uh, for the installer to just mark the outlet on the fiber termination box or the patch. Fiber optic link failures. Properly installed fiber optic link can still fail for a variety of reasons. In place fiber optic channels normally only fail for mechanical reasons. However, it is, quite, uh, it is quite impossible for transmitter and receiver optics to become marginal or fail. After installation of a fiber run, many connection failures result from simply picking the wrong patch or user cord. Others are mismatches between the installed fiber strands and the optical transceivers on, the, on, their, uh, on either end of the fiber. The game is to, is to quickly diagnose the nature of the problem and then determine a proper cure. Fiber optic bends and breaks. The most obvious reason for a link to fail while in operation is physical damage to the cable. Fiber strands, although very robust, cannot tolerate excessive bending. As a fiber strand is bent, its link loss will gradually increase, and this may cause the received power to fail or fall below the optical transceiver sensitivity. A fiber may be bent excessively during or after installation. The individual strands inside the fiber optic termination box are, are the most fragile. If a strain is bent too far, it may form micro fractures and the resultant increased loss can cause the link to be marginal or to fail. It is rare for a fiber to be bent so far that it fractures completely, but it is possible. That is why we are very careful to keep individual strands protected within fiber outlet boxes or fiber termination boxes. The best way to find microfracture faults is with a fiber optic test set. If your installation has good records, you should have the link loss measurement of all your fiber strands. An increased loss reading indicates either a connector failure or fiber fracture. By testing a, a strand with a time domain reflector, you will be able to uh, determine exactly where the severe bend or break has occurred. If you have the same failure at about the same place in multiple strands, you may be sure that there is a mechanical problem with the cable at that point. It is also possible to simply cut through a fiber optic cable. Cable cuts usually occur during construction or remodeling. However, cuts can also happen when other unrelated systems are being maintained. In any event, you can use the TDR method to optically measure where the cut has occurred and then physically locate the problem. Fiber optic cables may be uh, fusion spliced if there is a sufficient slack in the cable. In other cases, a jumper splice can be used. For most applications, a fusion splice uh, will function almost at the same level as the original strand, but be careful. As new rules recognize the additional loss and misalignment, that can occur with fusion uh, splices. Let's look at fiber optic modes and core mismatches. After the initial installation, the most common problem with fiber optic cable is that mismatching user and patch cords uh, with the installed fiber optic cable strands. Remember that fiber optic comes in three main types, 50 125 UM multi-mode, 62.5-125 UM multi-mode and 10 UM single-mode fiber. In addition, some multi-mode fiber is laser optimized so it can handle gigabit and 10 gigabit Ethernet. The most serious problems are mode, mismatch, mode mismatches. 
If a multi-mode transmitter and receiver are inadvertently patched into a single-mode horizontal or backbone cable, the losses can be excessive. The optical power that should have been spread over 50 or 60 micron core is faced with a tiny 10 micron core. In addition, only one mode of light from the transmitter source will propagate down a single mode fiber. The result is generally no usable connection, even though the user cord, sometimes called fiber jumpers, look just fine. For multi-mode mismatches, the problem is less serious, but trying to couple a 62.5 micron fibers or uh, optics uh, into a 50 micron fiber creates a significant signal loss. Almost 40% of signal cross uh, section. Now, fortunately, going the other way is not as bad. So you can, you, you may see a situation where one side of the link seems okay, but the other side fails. And this is simply explained by the fact that a 50 micron launch will illuminate a 62.5 micron fiber or receiver fairly well. So one direction will work and the other does not. The transmit link is fine, but the receive link fails, or vice versa, depending on uh, which end of the link has the mismatched jumper or transceiver. So troubleshoot the, uh, troubleshooting the problem. Well, troubleshooting involves active problem solving in an operating environment. To those of us who do troubleshooting on a daily basis, the process may seem obvious. However, to one learning about complex system operation, or to one who, who has to supervise the operations, it may be useful to cover some of the important troubleshooting concepts. If you, if you had to reduce troubleshooting methodology to just four uh, phrases, they would surely be as follows. Observe the problem. Logically divide the component parts. Test each portion of the whole. And make no assumptions. The first three items are logical, sequential steps. The last, make no assumptions really should be included at every step. Let's examine each, each step one at a time. First, you should observe the problem. Many times a problem will be asked, uh, problem you'll be asked to troubleshoot will involve more than just cable and wiring. To distinguish the problem from normal operation, you should be familiar with the normal operation. If not, you should at least get a description of normal operation that is as detailed as possible. In many cases, the best source of the description is an equipment manual or an expert source. The user may be of little help. Uh, here's an example. You're told by a user that the link to the server is down, but the user's computer is working fine in all the respects. You walk to the equipment room, find the link's hub connection from your excellent documentation, and observe that the hub card status lights are all off. If you are familiar with the hub's operation, then you know that at least one light should always be on. Even, when, even with the patch cable uh, removed. Uh, you wouldn't really need to check the cable in because you have found a hub card's failure. The next step is to logically divide the problem. Let's say that uh, we found the hub card lights normal, except for the one indicating a bad link to our problem workstation. Now we divide the problem logically. A workstation computer connects to the wall outlet, horizontal cable runs to the telecommunications room, determining a cable is cross-connected to a patch panel, and a patch cord runs to the hub equipment. The hub and computer both look fine, so let's look at the channel. Disconnect the user cord at the workstation, and the patch cord at the hub. Then, test the cable for short and opens. The cable link was working before the failure, so we don't have to be too concerned about other miswires. Now, of course, if the application is a Cat5e, uh, 100 meg one, then we want to be able to use a cable scanner for Cat5e test, since cable operation at the higher frequencies would be impaired without affecting DC continuity. If the cable checks good, the physical connection is no longer suspect. Next, you look at the computer setup, interface card, server setup, and all the other networking problems, uh, network items that could cause a logical connection to fail. Another way to logically divide the problem is through substitution of known good components. Alternatively, you could use substitution to verify the proper operation of suspected components, including computer and hub. For example, you can move a known good computer to the suspect bad outlet, or move the suspected uh, computer to a known good outlet. 
Substitution causes you to guess which component might be bad and then test your guess. It, it can be done with very little test equipment, but it requires you to proceed very methodically and with no preconceived assumptions. The third step, testing each portion of the whole. You might notice um, uh, has followed uh, immediately after we logically divided the problem. You must be very certain what you test or your test may be invalid. For example, what if we had a we had tested the permanent link instead of the channel in our prior example. Does that test all the cable? No. If the problem had been a failed user or patch cord, we would have missed it. So be uh, methodical. Be sure you understand the problem. Carefully structure your testing so that it eliminates any or as many variables as possible and makes no absolute assumptions. Well, that's it for now. Check online to see if there are any assessments that you can complete, and then come on back and let's finish up with chapter 18. See ya.